Glad to be back this morning, and uh, we're continuing a series this morning that we started a few weeks ago on uh, the Beatitudes. And so if you weren't a part of maybe the first uh, time we introduced this, you might be thinking, what is the Beatitudes? What does that even mean? And basically, it's, it just means blessing. It's a series of blessings that Jesus was pronouncing uh, to his followers in Matthew chapter 5. We see that. And uh, it's more than just blessings. It's actually characteristics that we are supposed to be living out in the Christian life. And so you see, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are, the, uh, are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are characteristics of the Christian life that Jesus is calling us to live out. And so a couple of uh, weeks ago, we started with the idea of poor in spirit, and that was Miss Ann had a great uh, analogy when she, she came up to me after the service and said, you know, I really had to flip it around to really make sense of it. It's spiritually poor. And she's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's this idea that in and of ourselves we have no spiritualness at all. We're totally dependent on the Father and, and what he's done for us, and it's not about ourself, it's about him, and it's a humble approach to the Lord. And so that's kind of the idea of poor in spirit. And we also talked about a lot of the context of what was going on in Matthew chapter 5. And so I would encourage you, we, we're really working hard at updating our website, and so we're trying to put the messages back on there. And so if you missed that, you can always go to the website and kind of get caught back up if you weren't here for the first uh, for the first message, because it does give it a lot of the context of what uh, was Jesus was actually doing in that in that time there. And so, one of the other things I just want to remind you of that we mentioned was this idea of blessed. What does blessed or blessed actually mean? And I think a lot of us we kind of take that and we're like, okay, blessed means well, I'm just I'm happy. You know, I'm happy, and, and we kind of look at it from a worldly sense, and it's really not that at all. It doesn't rise and fall on circumstances. If I do this and this goes well, well, I'm hashtag blessed, you know, and, but if what, that doesn't happen, then I'm not blessed, and we kind of look at it from those, those terms, and so that's really not what it means at all. Blessed is more like God declaring his approval over your life. He's declaring his approval over your, over your life. And here's some of the words that really work well to describe what this term means. Maybe even better, uh, what some would say, uh, fortunate. So you could kind of go to the first one. Fortunate are the poor in spirit, those who look to God above all things and are humble. Fortunate, well off, congratulations are in order. Or those who are living poor in spirit are living the good life. These are all ways of saying it's, it's a joy and a happiness that's independent of circumstances. It's not just a future joy. It's a joy for today. It's a joy that we can experience in the Christian life, in, uh, in our walk with the Lord. And one of the things that was so important that we mentioned was that these beatitudes or these blessings uh, or these characteristics of our life that Christ is calling us to they go against really everything that we kind of are in our human nature. They go against that. And so we have to have a deep work of the Holy Spirit in our life to live these things out. These are things that we have to pray through. Lord, help me to be poor in spirit. By the power of your spirit living inside of me, help me to be this way. And he'll begin to show you how to do that, how to live that kind of life. And so it really takes a work of the Holy Spirit. I think I, I said it like this, and I'll just say it like this again. To fully embrace this type of lifestyle there must be a trust in the grace of God and dependence on the Holy Spirit to give us the power that we lack to embrace the character that he demands. And so that's just the best way I could say it. Um, and so we kind of move on to this week. We're looking at this idea of blessed are those who mourn. And, and you guys, you live in the world that we live in, and you know that the world pretty much is geared to make us happy. You think about one of the number one destination, uh, vacation destinations in the world is where? Disney World, and what is Disney World's slogan? It's the what place on earth? The happiest place on earth. And you know, you, I've been there. You know, you go there for a week, and it's like the world just goes away. It is the weirdest thing, and it's like, you know, you just live in this weird realm for, for, for a few days. But the whole entertainment industry is based on making you happy. Um, you know, the, what's the motto of society? Be as successful as you ha can so you can be as happy as you can. And that's where we're really at as a society. And so when we talk about things like mourning, it's really not a popular subject, is it? Because we got to kind of deal with feelings and, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable to discuss and um, it's not really a popular subject at all. Yet this is exactly the beatitude that we're going to look at today that Jesus describes. Blessed 
or blessed are those who mourn. And so big picture today is this is what we really want to get down to when we kind of get through it all is that what is the kind of mourning that uh, Jesus is calling us to? What does that really look like? And then secondly, how are we comforted by that morning? How does that, how does that really take effect? Because I'll show you. Let's look at the Scripture, and you'll kind of see how the Scripture goes. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. It's on the screen. It's also in your notes, and I've got a guide there. You can kind of follow along. You can write in the answers if you want to. Um, but we're in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read verse 2 through 4, and then kind of get into it a little bit here. So no, verse 2, it says, Speaking of Jesus, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So we see this mourning takes place, and then there's a comfort that takes place. So we want to answer those questions. In order to get there, it's sometimes helpful to answer uh, what it's not, or even the opposite of. We kind of looked at some of that last time. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, letter A on your, on your sheet there is, what does mourning not mean? What does it not mean? Um, we think of mourning, when we think of that phrase, we automatically go to basically when we lose a loved one and we're in mourning. You've heard that over the years, you know, a, a person is in mourning over the loss of a loved one. And so, or, or there's some major tragedy in life and a person or a family goes through mourning. And, and here's the thing, we know that there is comfort in that. Uh, God promises to walk right beside us. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, there is, there is a peace, there is a comfort, although the pain is real, there is a peace and comfort that comes through that tragedy. But I don't think that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in this verse. And I'll tell you why, because he uses the phrase, blessed are those who mourn. And if we go back to what that word blessed means, it would be like saying, um, fortunate is the person who loses a loved one. Or congratulations are in order for those who experience death in their family. That makes no sense. It's, makes, it's honestly cruel when you look at it that way. So I don't think that that is exactly what Jesus had in mind here. I think what he's really driving at is that we're talking about a spiritual mourning. And letter B is, what does it mean to mourn? We're talking about spiritual mourning. And I'll show you what this is. It's, it's, it definitely could include physical tears, but it's based on a spiritual condition. It could be a, a spiritual condition in our own lives. It could be uh, the condition of the world that we live in. It could be the condition of people around us. But it has to do uh, primarily with a spiritual matter, okay? And so... Uh, if we think about it like that, what on earth could a spiritual morning look like? What would that look like where God's willing to say, blessed, I look with approval on this. This person is fortunate because they were mourning in this way. So we want to answer that question. Of that. Hopefully that's kind of connecting. That's what we want to answer. So number two, what, uh, what do we mourn over? What do we mourn over? And I've listed several things here that I think fit what Jesus is talking about here for things that we mourn over. And letter A is we mourn over sin pre-salvation. I'll explain that. We mourn over sin pre-salvation. And this is the picture of the unbeliever who first realizes their own sin. They realize their separation from the Father, and there's nothing they can do about it in and of themselves. They realize that. And so uh, in the Beatitudes, we often see the negative before the positive. If you go back a couple of weeks ago when we did poor in spirit, you saw that you first had to become poor in spirit or empty of yourself before you could be filled with the spirit. And in this uh, Beatitude, we see where sometimes you have to understand uh, the sin in your life before there's hope in Jesus Christ. So you see this before and after contrast here. And so one of the things is that conviction of sin always precedes true salvation. Think back when you heard the gospel. Um, hopefully what you heard was the reality that your, is, is that your sin separated you from the Father. You looked at, for the first time, you saw God and all his holiness and all his glory and all his power. And then you saw yourself. And you're like, man, I'm selfish. Man, I'm not worthy of, a, of, the, of, the, of the love of the Father like you sit back and you're like, you realize how far apart you are from the life that God's actually called you to live. And when people realize that for the first time, 
there's often a deep sense of sorrow in their life. Um, it's a spiritual mourning. And sometimes it's very emotional. Sometimes it's even with tears. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just in, it's simple trust in the Lord for his salvation. But either way, there is a sense of mourning over your sin. Um, yeah, there's a deep conviction that causes this kind of mourning. Did anybody, has anybody experienced that when you came to, know, uh, came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Did you sense that mourning in your life? Like, oh my gosh, I am separated from the Father, and there's nothing I can do about it. How many, uh, actually, anybody shed tears? Yeah, a lot of us did. I can remember very well, uh, you know, 12, 13, 12 years old, I believe, and in that moment of realizing, I hadn't heard the gospel, but it was like the first time it really set in that my sin had separated me from the Father. And it was just this deep sense of, of mourning over that. And so uh, the good news is, though, then in the midst of that, you hear that there's a, uh, there's a, there's a God who actually loves you in the midst of that. And in his love, he pro provided his son to take your place, that he bore your sins upon the cross. And so for the first time you hear that there actually is good news and that you can place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ to forgive you for those sins, to put you in a right relationship with the Father. And when that happens, many of you can attest to this too, the joy that comes along with that. All of a sudden, there's a hope for the future. There's a hope in Jesus Christ. There's a comfort that comes in that. And if you've ever experienced that, you know that comfort comes in that way. And we can see that. And so uh, that's just the first example. We mourn over our sin pre-salvation or the moment right before we trust in Jesus Christ. There's a mourning. We also, letter B, we mourn over sin post-salvation. Post-salvation. So we know, uh, if you're a Christian in here, you know that we still battle our sin nature, don't we? We battle our sin nature. We deal with temptation. We deal with evil desires. Uh, thankfully, our past, present, and future is all covered under the blood of Jesus. And we know it's not God's desire that we walk in sin as believers. We want to we walk closer to the Lord. The longer we walk with the Lord, the more we should um, you know, desire to shed off the sin in our life. Uh, the, more you wa the more you walk with him, the more you love him, the more you want to please him. And so what happens is when a Christian, we engage in unholy thoughts, unholy actions, unholy attitudes, the sense of conviction you can feel sometimes is a little overwhelming. And when you realize that, uh, what you've done and how you've offended the Lord, there's this sense of grief uh, as you mourn over your sin. Has anybody ever experienced this before? Yeah, absolutely. You sense this grief. Uh, and we see it in the life of Peter, don't we? Peter denied Jesus how many times? And what does the scripture say happened after that? He went out and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. He was mourning over his sin. We see it in the life of Paul. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 7 describes the, his battle with sin in his own life, what he was going through. And he gives us this real picture of mourning when he cries out, O wretched man that I am. He's just, there's a mourning there, O wretched man that I am. But in both these cases, we see conviction taking place, but never condemnation. And actually, when you, when you think about Peter, what does Jesus do? Jesus gently restores him and places him in a position of leadership in the early church. And so conviction led to mourning and sorrow, but mourning and sorrow led to a deeper walk with the Lord. And that's comforting to know. Conviction, this is one of my favorite sayings, conviction is God's invitation to a better way of life. It's God's invitation to a better life. It's not God shaming you. It's God showing you that there is a better way, and he's inviting you to walk in it. So don't ever let conviction be condemnation. Let it be God inviting you to a better life. And it may cause sorrow. It may cause mourning. But that mourning calls us closer walk and relationship with the Father. And so uh, that's the first one. We sin against God. And then we also mourn over our, our sin post-salvation when we sin against people. We sin against people. Number two, we sin against people. So what happens when you sin against another person? I think the way this happens mostly is we, it's with our mouths more than anything. Um, it could be a, it, you, you lash out in anger and you say things you shouldn't say. Uh, maybe it's gossip behind someone's back. Or it's a conversation that becomes just argumentative and ugly and, and really sinful. Uh, do you hold back on your pride and just blame the other person? 
And you're like, well, I'm not apologizing if they don't apologize. Me and, uh, me and Erica, who are our children's director, we're talking about just student ministry and children's ministry and how we see this so often in, a, in that age group. There's this idea that if someone offends you, you refuse to go and, you know, or, or you, you both offend each other. And it's like, well, I'm not doing anything until this person comes to me. And we just were talking about that and trying to train students at an early age to understand what it means to forgive and to apologize and how to walk clean before the Lord, walk clean before other people. And so that's a real thing. So what do we do in that? Do we, uh, are, are we saddened by broken relationships? Maybe you're in here right now and you've got a relationship with someone that's just, it's broken. You've offended them. They've offended you. Who's going to be the mature one and go to them first? Who's going to be the most mature I mean, that's what it comes down to. Uh, you're hurt by the things they said. They're hurt by the things you said. Is there a mourning in your life that's taking place where it's like, gosh, man, I want to get that right with this person. I don't want to walk in this anymore. Jesus describes a picture in Matthew 5. He says, if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come offer your gift. So stop coming in here on a Sunday morning and lift your hands and lifting your voices and worshiping and thinking everything's fine. Go to the person and make it right. Go to the person and make it right. That's what he's calling us to. So in a real sense, there's a mourning that should take place when we uh, offend someone else and we know that we're wrong. There's a mourning that takes place. The last one, uh, or second last one, letter C, it's we mourn over the condition of the world. We mourn over the condition of the world. In Luke 19, we see this picture of Jesus looking over Jerusalem, and it says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. See, Jesus knew that what was fixing to happen was Jerusalem, the people, the Israelites, had been sinful for so long. They had turned away from the Lord. They were fixing to receive judgment, uh, and they kind of received that through the Roman army when it came and invaded. They were fixing to have severe judgment on them, and it, it pained Jesus. It hurt him. And you see him weeping over Jerusalem and because uh, they didn't listen. They didn't listen to the warnings. And so do we feel that pain of the world around us? Is there a sadness that wells up inside of us when we think about the condition of people around us? And i I got to be honest, this, one, this is the one that hit home for me more than anything. Because what we do is we spend a lot of time in front of the, the news. And we watch all the bad things that happen. And it subconsciously creates anger, not at the world, but at people. And we just get mad. And we just, you know, we can kind of come to church and love each other. We go outside of church and it's like, Ugh, I just, I'm sick of people. I'm sick of the way people are. And I get it. I really do. I understand that. And we, and we, we read things like in First John that says, you know, well, we're not supposed to love the world. We hate the world. But John wasn't talking about people, was he? He was talking about the system of the world, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He kind of goes in to describe all that. It's the world system that we should hate. Because the same John that wrote 1 John wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote John 3.16, says, For God so loved the world. So we can't forget that part. And we know what God's talking about, what John's talking about specifically there, is the people in the world. We sang about it in the first song this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. And so we're called to love the world around us. Do we have such a love for people that it breaks our heart to know that they don't know the Father, to know that they don't have a relationship with the Lord? Does it break our heart? Or can we just very callously look over and kind of us four no more mentality and we kind of sit in our holy huddle and we're happy, but we disregard the world around us? Um, I remember there was, uh, in my early 20s, I was able to, or mid-20s, I was able to take some trips to the Middle East uh, on some mission trips. And one of those trips, uh, I think it was the first trip I was there, I was sitting in the front seat of this van uh, with the main missionary on my left and my pastor at the time on the right, and we were just talking and having this conversation. And I will never forget this. I, I, it, was, it was the most sudden thing I've ever experienced. I looked across to the, my left and I could see this field and there was this Muslim woman out in the field uh, working. And, I'm, and it was like an instant. The Lord just hit me with compassion and it was all I could do to sit there in front of those guys and not weep. It was the, it was the strangest thing but the Lord was filling my heart with compassion for that people. 
Because I knew that unless they're told the gospel, they're not going to believe. Unless they hear it, unless they understand it, unless they embrace it, they're destined for eternity without the Lord. And so there was just this real sense of, of compassion that welled up in that moment. And then over the years, there's been times where we've had prayer meetings of, uh, and really praying for people who don't know the Lord and asking the Lord to, to bring them uh, uh, to, to Christ, bring them through his mercy to Jesus Christ. Show us how to invest in them. Show us how to minister to them. Show us what to say. Lord, we're calling on the na- your name to, for these people that we're talking about. And there's been times where that's happened. And then I think about right now, I'm like, Lord, that's just not really my heart right now. I'm not in that vein, and I need to get there. And so maybe that's you this morning. You just not really, you don't think about those things much. And it's like, There needs to be a real sense of mourning over the lostness of society, the lostness of the people that live right back here in this neighborhood. What are we going to do about that? So there's a mourning that takes place. Fanny Crosby, in the great hymn writer, wrote a song called Rescue the Perishing, and I love this lyric. It says, Rescue the Perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, weep over the erring one, lift up the fallen, Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. She understood what it meant to mourn over the lostness of the world. Last one, we mourn, letter D, we mourn with others who are mourning. We mourn with others who are mourning. Romans 12, 15 just kind of spells this out real simple. Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Your translation might say weep. So there's a real connection of weeping and mourning there. Weep with those who weep. And we know we celebrate the triumphs each other goes through. We celebrate the triumphs, but just as important, we share in each other's losses. John 13 tells us that Christians are known by their love. What better example of love than to care for those who are going through hardship and pain, to walk right alongside them, to care for their needs, to weep with them, to say, hey, I got you, I'm with you, I care for you. And so we're called to uh, mourn with others who are mourning. And so hopefully this kind of gives you a a snapshot of what we're talking about, this spiritual mourning that we're going through. Um, And here's just kind of a summary. So all these examples are the kind of mourning that Jesus is calling blessed. The the, the person who engages in this is fortunate, is well off, is is to be congratulated It's a tenderness of heart toward God and other people. It's a deep concern over sin in our lives. It's a concern for the lostness of the world and concern for those among us who are hurting. That's what we're talking about right here. If we were to take this verse and put all these things in it together, the verse could sound something like this. Fortunate is the person whose heart is broken over their own sin. God approves of the person who, moved by tears, prays over the condition of the world they live in. Blessed is the person who stands alongside and comforts those who experience loss. Those who mourn like this will receive comfort in this life and in the life to come. That's the picture. Hopefully this answers the first question. This is what it looks like to mourn. And so let's move to the second question we want to talk about this morning. What's the promise What's the promise? The promise is what we've already read, that we are comforted. So write that down. We are comforted. But the question then is, how are we comforted? What does that exactly mean? What does that look like? And so I want to give you uh, three ways that I think we can receive comfort in the midst of our mourning. And the first one is this. Comfort comes in the forgiveness of God. Comfort comes in the forgiveness of God. And we touched on this a little bit earlier. But this is still dealing with the person who realizes that because of their sin, they lack relationship with the Father. They don't have a a trust in Jesus. They don't have confidence of eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first time they they, they feel like they they understand they got it all wrong and they, they begin to mourn over this. Or it's even a picture of the believer who is engaging in some kind of sinful activity and there's a mourning that takes place in that. And so how are they comforted? Well, it comes to the, the confession. We confess with our mouth. We confess that we're sorry. God forgives us. We trust in Jesus fresh. And Romans 4, 7 through 8 says it like this. Blessed are those whose lawless acts or sins are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a person the Lord will never charge with sin. 
And so again, we see this language of blessed. So the person that trusts in Jesus and whose sins is forgiven, they enter the blessed life. They enter the life of blessing, the true blessing of life. Now, what could be more comforting than that? And so we can kind of clearly see in Scripture that when we're forgiven, when we know that forgiveness, there is a comfort that comes with that. There's a hope that comes with that. And so that's the first one. It comes in the forgiveness of God. Secondly, comfort comes in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It comes in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14 has a lot to say about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And Jesus is, is talking in verses 16 and 17, and he says it like this. And this is in the Amplified Version, which I really like the way it brings out the full meaning of the word helper. Uh, it really explains this well. But in verse 16 it says, And I, this is Jesus, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, or comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, to be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive and take to its heart because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains with you and continually will be with you. So we see very clearly that Jesus has left for us, the followers of him, the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And it's described as helper, comforter, strengthener. And the word another in there is a really interesting word. It's another helper, but it means something real specific. It actually means one of the very same kind, one of the same character, same everything, or even duplicate. So get the picture here, okay? Jesus is describing that the Father is going to send another helper like me. And oh, by the way, it's a duplicate of me. It's just like me, where I stood in one you know, 30 mile radius in ancient Israel 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit will invade the hearts and lives of every believer across the world, and he'll be just like me. So Jesus was the first helper and comforter, and now the Father's sending someone like him. Here's, here's the way one translator says it, and I, this is, it's, I love this. I will pray to the Father, and he will send you someone who's just like me in every way. He will be identical to me in the way he speaks, the way he thinks, the way he operates, the way he sees things, and the way he does things. He will be exactly like me in every way. If the Holy Spirit is here, it will be just as if I am here because we think, behave, and operate exactly the same. So let's think about this. Let's think about this a little bit further. And we think about this comforting aspect of it. What was Jesus's, what was one of the things that Jesus had, we, we read over and over in Scripture that he had for people? He was compassionate, right? He had compassion for people. We see this in a number of ways. In Matthew 8, he had compassion on the diseased and the afflicted. In Matthew 9, he had compassion on the distressed and rejected. Mark 8, he had compassion on the weary and the hungry. In Hebrews 4, he sympathizes with our weaknesses and temptations. How many of you in here this morning are going through any of these things right now? Maybe you, you're going through an affliction or you're distressed or you feel rejected or you're weary or you're weak right now or you're going through temptation. Well, the promise is, is the Holy Spirit, who is just like Jesus, who has the same compassion as Jesus, lives inside of you and can bring you the same compassion and comfort that Jesus brought, that Jesus brings. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. Therefore, through the Spirit, the true believer has all the comfort, compassion, and sympathy that Jesus has to offer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so comfort comes through the forgiveness of the Father. Comfort comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. When we have all these things going on, there is a sense that we can depend on him to strengthen us and comfort us in those times of need. And then lastly, comfort comes in the care of others. Comfort comes in the care of others. So this is another way that God uses to comfort his children. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, Paul is given this uh, example here, and he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And if you know 
anything about Paul's story, you can go read the rest of 2 Corinthians, and he's going to go through this uh, litany of things that he had been through. He had gone through the ringer. He had been shipwrecked. He had been beaten. He had uh, done all these things that had happened. He had been stoned. I mean, all the, left for dead. All these things had, had gone on, yet through all of those afflictions, Paul had known the comfort of the Lord. He had known the comfort of the Holy Spirit inside of him, and he had been able to deal with that. And so Paul here is saying, hey, the same comfort that I felt from the Lord, I'm going to give you this in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to comfort you in all your affliction. I'm going to stand right beside you. The things that you walk through, I want to help you walk through those. I want to comfort you the same way that I felt comforted from the Father. And so God often use, uses other people to care for those in affliction. Uh, we, the, this, the, the simple thing is that whatever we walk through, we have the ability to help others walk through the same thing, don't we? You've kind of been there. I, one of the things I like to do every so often is go on these hiking trips. And so years ago, I went to, uh, a couple times to this place in Arkansas. It's like a 26-mile loop through the Ouachita Mountains. And uh, you got to kind of bring all your gear and you got to backpack and stuff like that. So last uh, May, I took a group of high school seniors and some college guys who had never been uh, before. I took them up there. And so we kind of, we met before and I explained to them, hey, this is the gear you're going to need. Uh, I had been there before after all. And I said, hey, you're going to need to have this gear. It's going to be important that you have ways to purify the water and, and all these different things. And because I had done the trip before and the first time I did it, we really started at the wrong spot. And I had to learn, like, that's really not the best spot to start. We, we actually need to start at the northwest corner and go co counterclockwise because we want to get through the mountains on the first day. We want to kind of plow through those mountains so our legs aren't killing us after carrying 40 pounds on our backs for the second and third day. And so I kind of showed them where to start. And then we kind of make the journey. And, you know, it's like, hey, this next hill is really intense. You're going to want to pace yourself. We get to a river crossing. It's, that's probably not the best spot to cross. You're going to want to take off your hiking boots here. You're going to want to put on, you know, water shoes right here. And you're going to want to walk. Make sure you use your sticks because the river is very treacherous. And you could fall in. If you fall in, you're going to get soaking wet. Your gear is going to get wet. So let's work together to make sure we get across this at the right spot. And so all the way... I can help those guys who had never walked that journey, walk that journey. Not only that, there's one particular spot that you kind of walk up this ridge and you get to the top and you see where the trail obviously goes off this way, but over this way, there's this little hidden trail. And you don't really notice it and it kind of goes up. You're like, eh, you know, I don't want to waste my time there. But the thing was, it was just a couple hundred feet if you hike that trail up you got to see this vista view of the entire valley, and you're on the top of the Brush Heap Mountain, I think it's called, Brushy Heap or something like that, but you're on top of the mountain. And so along the journey, we got to see the beauty of the journey. And had those guys not had someone who had been there before, they would have never saw the beauty of the journey, of the hardship. And it was hard. And look, they had to listen, because guess what? My good friend Sidney Bankston was on that trip, and Sidney Bankston thought he could go, hey, Sidney, you need good boots. Sidney thought you could go online and order boots from China and get a pair of boots that would last the journey. Sidney had about one mile left after 26 before those boots were destroyed. And I told the guys, hey, this next ridge is extremely difficult. It's higher than you think. You better pace yourself. And so... You know, I start walking up this, I'm, I'm pacing, I'm, of course, I'm older, I'm, I'm walking up this thing, nice and steady, I know better, and all those guys, are, you know, they think they're, you know, they know what they're doing and stuff, and so by the time we got to the top, I mean, I'm, it's hard, it's hot, I'm kind of out of breath, but I'm like, okay, let's keep going, they're like passed out, Sydney's laying on the ground, he's got his, he's got his bag off, he's soaking wet and sweat, I'm like, guys, you got to listen, and so there's a, there's an element of that as well, but the point remains that when you walk through some and first, you can uh, help people see the areas to avoid. You can help them see the joy in the midst of the pain, and you can comfort them in the midst of their trial. And that's just a real picture. There's a there's a pastor that was at um, First Baptist of Dallas for over 50 years. You might have heard of him. His name is George Truitt. He pastored First Baptist in Dallas, and he um, in one of I saw this story when I was kind of reading some of this stuff. He he told about an unbelieving couple. Listen to this. This might help you. He told about an unbelieving couple whose baby died suddenly. 
Dr. Chewett conducted the funeral and later had the joy of seeing both parents trust Jesus Christ. Many months later, later, a young mother lost her baby, and Dr. Truett was called to bring her comfort. Nothing he shared seemed to help, but at the funeral service, the newly converted mother stepped to the young woman's side and said this, I passed through this, and I know what you're passing through. God called me, and through the darkness, I came to him. He has comforted me, and he will comfort you. Later, Dr. Truett said, the first mother did more for the second mother than I could have done. For the first young mother had traveled the road of suffering herself. If we have experienced God's comfort, then we can comfort those in any trouble. I love that picture. So what God does is he turns our difficult circumstances and experiences into opportunities to care for others. God can use... Uh, other people in your life to bring you comfort, or he can use you to bring comfort to other people in your life. And here's the thing. We talked about this from day one, that these beatitudes, the promises that we see fulfilled, it's, it's a both and. The kingdom is now, but the kingdom is yet to come. The already not yet kingdom of God. We see the blessing in, in our life now, but we also see the ultimate picture in the kingdom to come in eternity. And so we can look at it in both ways. And so the beauty of this is whatever comfort we have in this life is wonderful. But even in, in all of that, if we're never comforted to the level that we feel like we need, we have a promise for future, for the future. And it's in Revelation. It's in Revelation, and we see this. Revelation 21 tells us this. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. So that's the eternal comfort for all of us who've trusted in Jesus Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thought? We have the promise of comfort to today, today, but even in those areas we lack, there's an eternal comfort for those who trusted in Christ. And so where this morning does that sit with us? Where do we, what, what, what kind, I know we, we talked about several different aspects of this, and probably the truth be known is that you don't fall into all those, but you might fall into one specific thing. Emma, if you come on up. Oh, where Emma's at? I want you to think about this. I want to read a couple of scenarios, and I just want to see if you fall in any of these cases. So let's take a minute as we kind of close out. I want you to, I want you to bow your head just, just so you can focus and listen. So I want to read just or explain just a couple of scenarios that I want you to think about. So first thing, this may be you this morning. See if this is you. You've listened this morning and you've heard multiple times us talk about the mourning of someone um, before they come to Christ and they're realizing the sin that separated them from the Lord and there's a mourning that takes place in that. And maybe that's you this morning. You don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior and you know that truth be known, your heart's not right before the Lord. You realize that your sin has separated you from the Father. And there's a sense of mourning that's, that's taking place in your life right now. It's a sense of loss. Like, Lord, you have so much more for me, but I'm living like this. And there's a real sense of mourning that's taking place. And what the Lord is saying in his mercy, he's saying, come to me. I will forgive your sins and I will bring you the comfort that you need. Is that you this morning? Does that describe anyone in here this morning? If it does, hold on to that thought. But maybe, secondly, maybe you're a believer this morning and you've trusted Jesus, but you're struggling in some unconfessed sin that you've either committed against God specifically or against a person specifically. And you're just kind of in agony over it. It's kind of all been brought to life again this morning and you, you kind of 
you know, you remember what you said over again this morning, you remember the thing you thought, and you remember that thing you did, and it's like, Lord, I just, it's coming back again, and there's just a mourning, there's a sorrowfulness, sorrowfulness about it. And this morning, God in his mercy is saying, come to me, confess your sins, and receive forgiveness and comfort. Does that describe you this morning? Is that what you're going through? If that's you, hold on to that thought. Thirdly, it may be that you fit in the category that I would say I fit in, and that's maybe you've just been cold as you look at the wickedness of the world and the people around you. You realize again that you need to have the same compassion that Jesus had toward the world, and you just need a fresh burden for, for the lost and for people who don't know Christ. And you want God just to work that in your heart this morning. Is that you? Does that describe your, the picture of your life right now? Just kind of hard toward the things of the world. Hold that thought in mind if that's you. And lastly, maybe this morning that you know someone who just needs comfort. Maybe they're in a difficult situation and uh, they need someone just to come alongside them and pray for them, to encourage them. Maybe they're here this morning and you know who that is and they're here and it may be an opportunity in a moment where you can just go to them and say, hey, I just want to pray for you. I want to hold you before the Lord. I want to sit with you right where you're at. I want to care for you. Maybe it's even the idea of weeping over those who weep. Maybe it's just weeping with them and help them, helping them carry their burdens. Is that you this morning? Do you have just a burden for someone else that's just weighing heavy and you want to see the Lord do a work in your heart and in their heart this morning. So I just want to remind you of this, that in all these things, it goes against the natural tendency. It goes against our flesh. It goes against our pride and our selfish attitudes. And what it takes is a work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask the Lord to move in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that for those of us in here that need comfort, they'll receive comfort. For those who need to just mourn over sin in their life, they would do that so that the comfort of forgiveness, the comfort of the Father would come in, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the comfort of someone else would move in. And so as I pray, I want our prayer team to come forward. I want our worship team to come forward. And we're going to take a few minutes as we close just to respond to that. If, 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 you're, if you're in any one of those categories and you want to see the Lord do a work in your heart this morning, um, I encourage you just to come. You can pray by yourself at the front. You can pray with a member of our prayer team. I'll be available as well. And we just want to pray with you and hold you before the Lord and trust God to move on your behalf. So you can sit back and, and, and not do anything. Or you can sit where you're at and deal with it. That's fine, too. But let's make this moment that we have a moment where we can um, get the things in our heart right before the Lord. So, Father, this morning, you've reminded us, Lord, of this sense of mourning that you bless. Lord, you approve of this. You say the person who lives with these characteristics in their life are to be congratulated this is living the good life in the kingdom of God. So Lord, in the areas that, that you're working in right now, would you just expose that, expose our heart, the areas that we need to conform to the image of Christ, the thoughts that we need to take captive, the people that we need to be praying for, the people that we need to go to and just ask forgiveness of, Lord, you want us clean before you. Lord, and when we do that, there is this great sense of comfort and peace and hope that comes when we're free of all those things. So Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you help us to live these things out this morning? Help us to respond to the way in which you want us to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. So as our worship team begins to play, we have people available. You just respond as the Lord leads you. You can come forward and uh, receive prayer or pray with someone. So do that now.
Father, we praise you this morning. We thank you so much again for how much you care for us, how much you love us, how much you're willing to walk with us through our hurts and our pains to where we could sing loudly, it's well with my soul. So Lord, we want to live the blessed life. Help us to be uh, the people who live out of the character of Jesus Christ. Help us each week as we learn these truths, Father. We praise you and we thank you this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You guys are dismissed Wednesday night, regular stuff on Wednesday night, and we'll be back next week. See you then.